Now, friends, we've come to the epistles that are customarily called general epistles. That is, any particular church. Actually, they are also designated Catholic epistles in the sense that they're universal because they are not addressed to a particular individual church, but to the church as a whole, but to a particular group in the church. And here, it's to the diaspora. It begins with James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now, I want to go into that in just a moment. But when he says the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, it's obvious to us what he means. He means the believers in Israel. He's writing to the Christian Jews of that day. After all, the early church was 100% Jewish for a, quite a period of time. And then a few Gentiles began to come in, and then a flood, a great what we would call revival, broke out in the heart of the Roman Empire where Turkey is today. And that's where the seven churches were. And literally there probably could be said several million turned Christ. And I think there's an abundance of evidence for that today. But many of these were Israelites, and these epistles are sent in that direction. And the epistle of James has been compared to the book of Proverbs, for instance. There are many similarities. And then the others have compared it to the Sermon on the Mount. And that, may I say, is also accurate because, after all, this man James was a blood brother, half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that probably we ought to have a word to say now about the James that we're talking about. Back in Hebrews, you remember we had a problem of authorship. Who wrote Hebrews? Did Paul write Hebrews? I believe he did. But there are others that think Dr. Luke did, others Barnabas. And so they've come up with quite a few. And we have a problem of authorship here in the epistle of James. There's no question but what James wrote James, but what James was it? There are those that have found six different Jameses mentioned in the New Testament. Well, it's quite obvious that in several places they're talking about the same James. And I believe that you can find at least three that are clearly identified. And some, of course, make that four. But I would settle for three. And what we have here is, first of all, there's James, the brother John. He was one of the sons of Zebedee, and they were called by our Lord sons of thunder, you remember. Now, he was slain by Herod, and you will find that in the 12th chapter of the book of Acts. You remember that Herod took James and slew him, and Simon Peter he put in prison. Then we have the second James that is mentioned, James, the son of Alphaeus, called James the Less. He's mentioned in the list of apostles, but very little is known concerning him. And I dismiss him automatically. Then we have the third James, and he actually is the Lord's brother. And that means he was a son of Mary and a son of Joseph. And that would make him a half-brother of the Lord Jesus, by the way. Now, we have a reference to him. In fact, at the beginning, you remember his brethren did not believe in him at all. And we have it mentioned in Matthew, the 13th chapter, verse 55. Let me read that. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joe and Simon? and Judas, so that James is the one that we believe wrote the epistle of James. Now, he became head of the church at Jerusalem. And in the 15th chapter of Acts, why we find that at that great council in Jerusalem, he seemed to preside over it. He seemed to have been the chairman. And he at least made the summation and brought it to a decision 
evidently led by the Holy Spirit. And I think that Paul actually had reference to him. You remember it over in Galatians, the second chapter, Paul had something to say about him. And I'd like to turn there and just read that verse very briefly. Verse 9 of chapter 2 of Galatians says, Then when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. What we have here is the man that we believe is the author of this epistle. Now, it was apparently written in about 45 to 50, not any later than 50 or not any earlier than 45, but probably nearer 45. Now, there have been those that have said that James wrote his epistle to combat the teaching of Paul, that he emphasizes works and Paul was emphasizing faith. Now, I'm going to go into that later on here. But may I say to you very candidly, that couldn't be true because the first epistle that Paul wrote was First Thessalonians. And the earliest that could have been was 52 to 56. So that even Paul's first epistle was not written until after James had written. James is the first writer in the scripture, if you take it chronologically. And very frankly, when you look at it like this, why well, you have to admit, and I heard, by the way, a liberal speaking one time, and he made the, the mistake of saying that James wrote in order to correct Paul and his doctrine of justification by faith. But that man hadn't looked into it very thoroughly, or he wouldn't have made that boo-boo. Actually, and I'll go into this later, the theme of James isn't works at all. It's faith, the same as Paul. He tells you what faith produces. Now, I'm going into that later on, so let me come back here to the introductory matters that have to do with this. And probably... I ought to go into it this far, at least. You find that both men are putting an emphasis on faith and on works. They use the expression a great deal. I think James' entire theme throughout the epistle is faith and what faith does. And they give the two aspects of faith, of justification by faith. And Paul emphasizes both, by the way. He makes it very clear that faith is the way that you're justified, but that that faith produces works. And he could say, though, for by grace are ye saved, and not of works, lest any man should boast. And it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But Paul also wrote, These things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they who have believed in God might be careful, to maintain good works. That's Titus 3.8. And then in Ephesians 2.10, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, faith is the root of salvation. Paul emphasizes that. Works are the fruit of salvation, and that's the thing that James emphasizes. Faith is the cause of salvation and works the result of salvation. And when Paul talks about works not saving you, he's talking about works of the law. And when James emphasizes that works are important and essential, he's talking not about works of law, but the works of faith. Show me your faith. Without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. And God looks down, sees your heart. He knows whether you believe or not. That is justification by faith. But your neighbor next door, he doesn't see your heart. He can only go by your works, by the fruit of it. And we'll be talking about that quite a bit in this epistle. Now, I consider the two key verses in this epistle but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, 
deceiving your own self. And then James 2.20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Now, as we've indicated before, this is a practical epistle. And James was a very practical individual, apparently. Tradition says that he was given the name of Old Camel Knees. And the reason is he spent so much time in prayer. And he deals with practical issues like the ethics of Christianity, not doctrine. And he's really going to bear down on that, by the way. But he won't get away from faith at all. And the epistle of James, as we've indicated, has been compared to the book of Proverbs and also the Sermon on the Mount. And justification by faith is demonstrated by works, and justification by faith must be poured into the test tube of works and of words and worldliness and of a warning to the rich, by the way. Now, you have in the outline that I've given... In the first three chapters, the verification of genuine faith. Now, how can you tell? God tests faith, first of all, by trials. And we have that now here in the first 12 verses of the first chapter. Now, let me come back to verse 1 again. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now he calls himself a servant of God, and that is actually a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses that term. Now I do not know about you, but I'm confident, had I been the half-brother on the human side, to him, somewhere in this epistle, I'd have let you know it. Well, I would have done it in a very pious way, of course. I would have brought it in in a very humble way. But I sure would have let you know it. James doesn't do that. He calls himself a bond slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at first, his brethren did not believe. Well, after all, they've been brought up with him. They played with him. They have seen him grow. They notice he's unusual, but they don't think that he's the savior of the world. You see, the thing we emphasized in Hebrews, our Lord Jesus was so human when he's here on this earth, even at first, his own brethren did not. And of course, the hardest people to reach is your family always. And yet they are the ones we ought to try to reach. Well, thank God, James came to know the Lord Jesus, not as his blood brother, but as his savior. And then he became the bond slave. And you notice who he calls him. He gives him now the full name, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Lord. And as we saw, Jesus is the human name. He knew him as Jesus, his half brother. But also he knew him as Christ, the Messiah that had come and died for the sins of the world, and that Jesus was not just the name, but he was called Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. Now, it's to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Wait a minute. I thought 10 of them got lost somewhere. Oh, no, friends, as we saw in Hosea, no tribes really got lost. God scattered them throughout the world, and James is just confirming it. They're scattered throughout the world. And they just don't happen to have settled in England or in the United States, although there are a lot of them in both places. But the second largest population outside of the nation Israel is in Russia today. And they are in China. They're in Japan. They are scattered abroad. Now he's written this to the believing Jews of that day that were scattered abroad and the word greeting here, well, that's a little stilted. I think that is all right for Elizabethan days and for good old King James. But very frankly, the word literally means in the Greek, rejoice. He writes to him and he says, rejoice. This is James. He was no sour puss. He wasn't stuck in the mud. He's no dead stick by any means. This man had a lot of life to him. And now he says, rejoice. 
Now he's going to talk about rejoicing under unusual circumstances. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into various trials. I'm reading from the new Schofield Reference Bible, and I think they've done a marvelous job right through here in making these changes. When you fall into various trials. In other words, when you're having trouble, don't start crying and boo-hooing as if something terrible has happened to you. Why, you're to rejoice. Count it all joy that God is testing you this way. And the question arises, is the Christian to experience joy in depth in all the trials and troubles and tensions of this life? And I'm going to be very frank and say the answer is no. And that's not what James is saying. It actually leads to unreality to say, I'm reconciled to the will of God when trouble comes to you, when you're really not reconciled. I've talked to people say, very piously say, oh, I'm reconciled. And they go around with a long face and weep half the time. Well, you are not reconciled to the will of God till you can rejoice, friends. Now, it's a form of insanity to adopt that pseudo-pious attitude. The trouble is not given to us for trouble's sake. It's never an end in itself. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing this, that the testing of your faith worketh patience. Now, God has a goal in mind. You're to count on it. And this has to do with the attitude of your heart towards your trouble. And the Aries tent here suggests the joy that is the result of the trial. You remember back in Hebrews when we were there not too long ago, and we said there in the 12th chapter that one method God uses is called chastening. And actually, it's child training. Now, trials actually are meaningless. Suffering is senseless. Testing is irrational unless there's some good purpose served by them and a sound reason for them. In other words, God says there's a reason for them and there's a good reason for it. All things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. Now, when the external pressures of testing are upon us and we're placed in the fires of adversity and calamity and tragedy and suffering and disappointment and heartbreak, then the attitude of faith is that God has permitted it for a purpose and it's a high and lofty goal in view. And we know that God is working out something in our lives. Now, that doesn't mean, and I probably should keep on by saying it doesn't mean that we can understand the purpose. This is the test of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. God nothing does nor suffers to be done but what we would ourselves if we could see through all events of things as well as he. That is something that some one in the Middle Ages gave, and I forget now who it was, but it just came to me. What are some of the purposes served in the testing of faith? Has God put down any guidelines? Well, here in this epistle, it's the proof positive of genuine faith. Knowing here, knowing this, knowing what? That the testing of your faith worketh patience. Let me use a rather homely illustration. Out here at one of these aeroplane plants, Douglas plant, I had the privilege of leading to the Lord a secretary, one of the officers out there. Years ago, she attended my Thursday night Bible study, and she's the one that got Bible classes started in that great plant out there. She was a little bitty trick, a very small woman. She wouldn't weigh 90 pounds wringing wet. But she was a dynamo. And so I used to go out there and speak. She'd invite me to come out and speak to the group. And it was a very fine group of Christians. And there have been several were saved out there. But while I was there, I saw something about how they build airplanes. And they start out with a new design of a plane. 
and it's put first on the drawing board. And then blueprints are drawn up. And then models of it are made. And they test the models. And then the construction begins. And two years goes by, and then there rolls off the assembly line one of these planes. And the question still is, will it fly? Will it perform? Will it stand the test? Well, they have test pilots. The test pilot takes it out on the runway, and he takes off. I sure wouldn't want that job. And he puts it through the paces up in there. Will it stand this kind of test? And it proves to be all that the maker said it was. And now there's confidence in the plane. And one of these airplane companies that fly planes, why they buy it and then they bring it up to the airport and passengers enter it. And that's the way that it gets into the air and becomes serviceable and useful. Now, genuine faith must be tested. Ore is brought to an assayer to see if it's gold or silver. And he puts a fire under it. He pours acid on it. And then he declares it's genuine. Now, God tests faith to prove that which is genuine. If someone has put it like this, the acid of grief tests the coin of belief. And there's a lot of truth in that. And God does it for a purpose. Now, listen to him. Verse 4. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Now, that's a very marvelous verse. God tests you in order that he might produce something in your life, and that's patience. Now, how does God produce patience? Well, let's look at this. Let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Now, it was patience that makes us a full-grown Christian. And the very interesting thing is, patience is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You never be patient by trying, and neither does the Holy Spirit place it on a silver platter and offer it to you as a gift. Patience comes through suffering and testing. You'll never be a perfect, now that means a complete a full maturation, a full orb personality as a Christian. And you can't be that without patience. Now, some Christians, therefore, never really grow up. They always remain babes. Every pastor knows that. I made this statement one time when I was pastoring downtown Los Angeles, and I got just a few little chuckles, not too many. I made the statement one morning that there were more babes in the main auditorium than they were down in the nursery. And I tell you, that won't get many laughs. And the difference is, though, the babies down in the nursery were beautiful. But the babes sitting in the auditorium, they're not very pretty. Why all this clamoring and criticizing and finding fault? There's turmoil and tension and trouble in so many churches. Well, you listen to David. David says in Psalm 131, it's just a psalm of three verses. He says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Well, that's a marvelous statement, but listen to him. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that's weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. David said, in my life, I found out I had to grow up. And I had to get off of milk and start really eating a good porterhouse steak and eating the bread of life. I had to grow up. And God tested David. And that enabled him to grow up. And Paul says that's one of the results of being justified by faith. He says, verse 3 of chapter 5 of Romans, not only so, but we glory or we joy in troubles. Also, knowing that trouble worketh patience, and patience experience, and so on. There's a purpose in it all, you see. And the reason today we have so many shallow 
and superficial saints. And there's so many that have a feeling of insecurity as Christians. And then there's those that try to be the intellectual group and they question the word of God. Then there are those that think, well, if we enter the new morality, well, my suggestion is why not try the old morality? But the problem is they never grow up. They're little babes, you see. And God gives testing and trials to produce patience in our life. That's the way that we become patient. Now, patience, therefore, comes through suffering and testing. And that means we will grow up and become full-grown children of God. And how we need that today. God must send us trouble so that we learn patience and it'll produce hope and then it'll produce love in the lives of men and women. And I have watched that over the years. I knew a man always finding fault. And when I became pastor, I never had such a critic. And he began to tend on Thursday night. I noticed he brought his Bible and took notes. And less than 10 years, that man grew up. And believe me, in that time, God sent him a great deal of trouble, and I mean real trouble. He became one of the sweetest Christians I ever met in my life. My friend, you see, this type of testing is something that God gives to those that are his own. Now will you notice the next verse here. He says, if any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Now, I think the wisdom here, very candidly, is related to the thing that he's talking about here. I today have trouble and trials. I have problems. You have problems. How are you going to solve this problem? How are you going to meet this issue? How are you going to deal with this person? Well, we need to go to God in prayer. If you lack wisdom in this regard, wisdom is really the exercise and the practical use of knowledge. There are a great many people today who have knowledge, but they don't have any practical sense whatsoever. I used to play golf with a man who was a PhD, and I never shall forget one day, even to this good day, I get a good laugh about thinking about it. It started raining. And he looked at me, and in utter amazement, he said, what shall we do now? Well, <laughs> I want to say this to you. You don't have to have a Ph.D. degree to get in out of the rain. But here's a man with a Ph.D. degree, didn't have sense enough to get in out of the rain. I said, I think we better seek shelter. May I say to you that wisdom is to know how to act under certain circumstances of testing and trial. And when problems come up and questions come up, life is filled with these, my friend. And therefore, you and I need to have from God wisdom. Well, what do you do? Well, he's in the business of giving it out liberally. Here means he just simply helps you out in times like that. And he upbraideth not means it's pure, simple giving of good Without any admixture of evil or bitterness, that's what you and I are to do. If we lack wisdom, let's go to God, and he's going to hear and answer your prayer. But listen to him, verse 6, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Our problem today is, maybe that's not your problem, it's been my problem over a great deal of my Christian life, is I just haven't believed God. Now, don't misunderstand me. I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I believe with all my soul he saved men, and he's going to save me for heaven. I believe that with all my heart. But down here, where the rubber meets the road, that's where I've had my problems. I went through college in almost total unbelief. Now, what I mean by that is this. I didn't believe God could put me through college. I was a poor boy. I had to borrow money. I had to work. I had to work at a full-time job, and it was difficult. And every year I'd finish, I couldn't think I could come back the next year. And lo and behold, God always had opened up a door. And I actually went through college a miserable fellow. And I look back over it now, boy, the fun I could have had if I'd only believed God. Let him ask in faith. Nothing wavered. 
Why don't you believe God today, friend? And I'm talking to you as a Christian friend. You've got a long face today. You're wondering how this is going to work out and how that's going to work out. I know exactly how you feel. I've been there. May I say to you, why don't you believe God? Why don't you trust him? Turn it over to him. Do you lack wisdom? And believe me, I know this. I do not have the brains to meet the problems of life. I'm not capable today of actually living in this complex civilization. But I got a heavenly father, friends, and he can supply even the wisdom that I need and that you need. And then he says here, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. You say, well, I believe God's going to work this out. And then when the time comes, we jump at it ourselves and we leap at it and make our own decision. I've done that several times. I turned it over to the Lord. I believed him. But the next day I didn't believe him. And I decided since nothing had shown up by way of a solution, I'd solve it myself. That's when I made my mistake. He's like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now he says, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. If you're going to work it out, then God can't work it out for you. If you're going to go in like a bull in a china closet and try to work something out, why not turn it over to God? Now he gives a proverb here. And this 